Welcome everybody to our Wednesday Bible study. Thank you for, um, I don't know if you enjoyed listening to Meatloaf or not, but that singer, Meatloaf, uh, was named that, nicknamed that by his father, who was um, apparently a very cruel and violent man, but he turned the name Meatloaf into obviously his trademark and is known the world wide. That song you heard was released in 1993. It was written by, anybody know who, well, I won't, I won't give it away. Don't look, don't look. Anybody, <laughs> anybody know who wrote that song? It's okay. Uh, Jim Steinman wrote almost every song that Meatloaf ever sang, and he was a fan of big, operatic, over-the-top, rock and roll, anthem-type songs. So that's why Meatloaf uh, sounds the way he does, but it was one of those kind of perfect uh, marriages, Lennon-McCartney, uh, uh, Bernie Taupin and Elton John and Jim Steinman and Meatloaf. And the reason I picked that song for today is because we're going to see King David, not yet King, but David, meet his future bride, his second wife that we know of, Abigail. And uh, they fall in love and um, Abigail saves David's bacon. Uh, she steps in, so the, it, I would sort of, I imagine her saying to David, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. I won't help you kill my current husband. Uh, I won't do that. So we'll see what happens. We're going to break this up over two weeks because it is a long uh, chapter, a lot going on, a lot to talk about. Um, but I think it'll be interesting. Anybody f familiar with the story of David and Abigail? All right, I love it. I love it when it's new stuff. Um, again, all, we, all most people know uh, about 1 Samuel is just David and Goliath, and that there was a King David, and, Beth, and maybe the Uriah, Bathsheba story uh, is known, but this is um, another uh, really interesting story that um, I'm looking forward to exploring with you. So, as I remind you, as always... Uh, the schedule, I want to always put it, kind of highlight some things that we will not meet on Thanksgiving week, so you'll have that time off. Um, but that's the only schedule change coming up. Uh, and I think that's it. And then we can, we can pray and uh, jump in. So uh, let's pray. Dear God, help us to read and understand what you would have us understand in this passage. And we ask your help in doing so. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Has anyone here ever um, had an overwhelming emotional response to some stimulus? It could be a big stimulus. It could be a small stimulus. Sometimes after 999 small stimuli, the thousandth time is the one that sends you over the edge. I've told you 999 times that after you take a drink of water to put the glass in the dishwasher and not leave it next to the sink, it's okay for 999 times, but the thousandth time you, as they say in the South, you lose your religion, meaning you lose your composure, you lose your um, equanimity, your tranquil and loving kindness to the world, and you explode, have a volcanic explosion. It could be when someone else drives your car and they forget to adjust the seat back to the way you like it. For the 999 times it's fine, but the thousandth time it's too much. Or it could be um, any number of things. It could be the person that gives advice unsolicited. Um, it could be a big and serious thing. Sometimes there are you, you discover a secret that the person you live with has been holding for a very long time and you have a overwhelming emotional response to the revelation of that secret. You'd be amazed about the number of people that have some really enormous things that they've never told you. Um, uh, you could uh, have a, an enormous or an overwhelming emotional response to somebody um, doing something that you feel gets in your way. Uh, if you wanna see somebody have an overwhelming emotional response, go to New York, walk on the sidewalks in Manhattan and walk slowly <laughs> and occasionally stop and look around <laughs> and you will see native New Yorkers get extremely frustrated and have an overwhelming emotional response uh, to your actions and will probably in colorful local dialect let you know how they feel maybe with some gestures as well 
about so some, some sign language. They'll indicate to you their emotional response. So is there a time that you have lost your temper recently or had an emotional response that sort of came out of you and you were like, oh my gosh, where did that come from? Anybody have yeah. their internal volcano erupt recently? Yes. Yes. It was, I was, used to have to do the Christmas cards for work. Okay. And I was told my Christmas cards would be ready on a certain day. I went to a certain local place and got the run around. They sent me here, they sent me there, they sent me back. You know, no, we didn't tell you that, and I finally flew. Yeah. And how did you feel in the moment? Like I wanted to strangle the clerk. I mean, just I was furious. Any any feelings afterwards? I was actually kind of proud of myself. Good. Okay. <laughs> proud. Proud of yourself. Yes. Um, anybody else have the courage to share? Yes. This morning. Sandy. This morning. <laughs> Breaking news. Passwords. <laughs> oh, passwords. Wanted to sign up for Blue Apron again. Okay. Didn't have the password. They won't let me get in. Blah, blah, blah. You know, the, just the usual frustration with passwords. Yeah. And I kind of lost a little bit. And then I okay. said, you know, I'll come to Bible study. Yes. And <laughs> go back and now find I'm bringing my it up again. Yeah. And, and try again. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, uh, the, the challenge of trying to enter a password and you've forgotten the password, you need to reset the password and you think you reset it, but it doesn't work and you have to do it again and all of that stuff. And then if you want to check your email to get the code that they've sent you so you can do it, then you don't remember your email password. <laughs> and around and around yes. we go. Um, yes, I have, I have, I have, I've been the in-home IT support for several family members in similar situations. So. I can relate. Uh, what else? Anybody else have a have an emotional outburst? Tommy. I smashed my bread at church at the store. You smashed what at the store? My bread. Your bread? Oh, they were like bagging it and they put the milk on top of the bread? What did you do? I want to see Tommy get mad. Can you demonstrate? Can you demonstrate for us what you did? Well, they just get in a hurry and they, they put stuff in the bottom and then put stuff on the top. And then I, it's in between, my bread is in between. So you ended up with a tortilla. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and how did, what did you do? I tell them, look, my bread belongs to the top. <laughs> and did they respond appropriately? Yeah, we're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your tortilla. Yeah, we're sorry. Um, anybody else have an emotional outburst they'd like to share with the class? Well, Gail Baird keeps it tranquil. <laughs> Very good. But lots of times when I'm coming back uh, toward my house on Valley Mills, people see this gray hair and me driving like this, and a big pickup truck mm. that makes lots of noise will get behind me. They can't go around me because there's cars and rain on either side. And they rev it up and go boom, boom, till they finally can go around. Yeah. And they're so happy. Yeah, they will arrive at the destination in three seconds. Yeah, so you you see people have these emotional responses. They they cannot bear that you are driving and they abiding. Have to be in line. Yeah, they, they are. Have to be first. They, have to they have to be it's first. The competition. The competition. And the first uh, vehicle wins. Okay. Yes, the first vehicle wins. I mean, we're always in a race all the time. Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting the things that set us off. Um, calling any company for customer service. Uh, getting a, a, a menu where you have to listen to the options to press one for this, press two for that, and then you lose your train of thoughts. So you have to press nine to repeat these options, and then you don't quite hear it. And anyways, there's a lot of these frustrations, and sometimes they're again, sometimes they're big frustrations. Sometimes there's big things that you 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 kind of lose it. Uh, sometimes it's little things. Sometimes it's things that build up over time. But uh, what we're going to see today with King David is that he, uh, he loses it. This is the man after God's own heart, who we've been talking about as a real uh, contrast to King Saul. Saul is this hot-tempered, narcissistic, uh, impatient man who now has had the kingship removed from him. And just to refresh your memory, 
something that's important for today's class is 10 chapters ago, chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, uh, Saul was commanded to bring God's judgment on the Amalekites, these bad guys who had treated Israel very poorly when they had left Egypt. And so they were given an assignment from God, go destroy the Amalekites, wipe them off the face of the map. Just like God did with the flood, I want you, instead of flood waters, I want your army to be the tool of judgment on the Amalekites. That's a big conversation. We had that 10 weeks ago. But uh, nevertheless, Saul heard those instructions, thought he knew better. He won the battle, but kept the king as sort of a trophy, a prisoner of war, a Brittany Griner, if you will. Someone I can say, look, I've got one over on you. I kept your guy. Uh, and he, um, uh, you know, Brittany Griner's going to a penal colony oh, now in Russia. Yeah. Hard labor. Hard labor, yeah. So uh, pray for Brittany. It's a, it's a really rough thing. Uh, so uh, the, um, Saul kept the king, didn't kill him, kept all the livestock, which he was commanded to slaughter, because it looked tasty to him and to his troops. And so that's when Samuel showed up that time and said, what is this bleeding of sheep and uh, goats I hear? Um, what is this sound in my ears? It was the sound of disobedience. Saul had been told to kill all the livestock. He didn't. He kept it as the spoils of war. And so, um, uh, and, and on top of that, the cherry on top of Saul's kind of I know better than God actions, he had erected a monument, probably a statue of himself in that spot to, it's verse 3 of chapter 15, to this is the place where I was awesome. Look at me. And of course Samuel shows up and finds all this, and that's the point where God says, I have now have lost, uh, I, I regret that I made Saul king. And the kingship uh, is stripped from Saul at that point. Now it'll take time for that to work out, but he's, he's essentially um, uh, kind of a lame duck king at this point, and just waiting for the other shoe to drop. So that all happened in Carmel. Chapter 25, the chapter we will read today, happens in the same place. So that should all be in, your back, in the back of your mind as you think about Saul is bad, David is good, and now we're going to see what happens in this passage today and learn something about ourselves. Because again, these stories are sort of reflections, mirrors that help us take a look at ourselves and maybe do a little therapy. We've already done some of that, the airing of grievances, mostly among the front of the room here. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you know, in, in Seinfeld, the, the holiday Festivus invented um, by uh, George's dad, I think. Festivus, where you, instead of Christmas, you have this holiday he invented called Festivus, where there are feats of strength and airing of grievances. And you've aired some grievances today. It's hope, hopefully you feel a little lighter. It's always good to vent. Um, uh, but the other the kind of therapy that we get from this passage is we see ourselves in the characters in these uh, stories. And I think being seen and known is a step to healing. Sanctification, the process of becoming more Christ-like, more set apart for God, it's not a process of me trying hard to get better. It's more often than not a realization of who you are in reality and that you are loved in that place. And that begins to be the, the key in the lock of the human condition that begins to um, change. If you ever have had somebody judge you from the outside or yourself judge yourself, that's usually not the source of change. Being loved at a place where you felt unlovable or weak, if somebody came up to you at a dark time and put their arm around you, that's the thing that tends to produce change in human beings. And uh, what we get in this text, essentially, is God showing us human after human who does not make the grade, even somebody as good as David, and we begin to get a sense that God maybe is for sinners. That God is someone who can come alongside and, and um, bless and forgive and even empower and use, for good purposes, uh, actual human beings. 
And um, there's always these stories like the one we'll read today, where it just as, as soon as we start thinking, people are getting better, and David is great, and if David is great, then I can be great too. If he could attack that Goliath, then I can attack the Goliath in my life. Well, you'll see what he does today with somebody who's much smaller than Goliath. Um, he doesn't display the same kind of attitude. So let's get into it. Let's read. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to talk about 1 Samuel 25. Pull up the text here. Uh, now, Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran, and there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm. And they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes. Before we come on a feast day, Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited, and Nabal answered David's requests. They answered David's servants, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? And there are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers? And give it to men who come from I do not know where. So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, Every man grab his holster. No, strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we went with them. They were a wall to us both by night and by day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know this and consider what you should do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his house. And he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took two hundred loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five seahs of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and two hundred cakes of figs and laid them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And as she rode on the donkey and came down under cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning... I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. Here endeth the lesson. So, summarize for me uh, and for this, uh, for our, our conversation here, how, how does this story begin? What's the first thing that happens? Samuel, 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 dies, Samuel dies, right? Then, then what happens? What's the next... Uh, Next event in the story. He went down to the wilderness. 
Yep, David goes down the wilderness. He moves to this area called Paran, which is uh, kind of northwest corner of Sinai, just a wilderness area. Um, what happens next? We hear all about Nabal. Yeah, we learn that there's a guy named Nabal, and he's married to a woman named Abigail. Uh, what else? Did you say something for me? Abigail is wise. Yes, her wisdom. She is wise. This, we get this, um, uh, Nabal is ugly and dumb. Abigail, beautiful and wise. So it's very much kind of this contrast between the two. But Nabal um, must be pretty well. Nabal is very wealthy. It says he's rich, and then if we don't believe him, don't believe the text, we're not sure. He says how, how many uh, animals he has. He was very rich, 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. When I moved to Texas, the first person I met that had a ranch, I lived in Houston, and I was serving at a large church in an affluent neighborhood, and a lot of people had ranches. And I said, oh, a ranch. You know, I... I had lived in Pittsburgh and Boston and North Carolina. People don't have ranches. So, a ranch, what do you, oh, cattle, oh, how many cows do you have? And I learned very quickly, you don't ask. It was like asking, somebody has golden retrievers. Oh, how many golden retrievers do you have? I'm just curious. How many fish in your aquarium? How many cows on your ranch? It's all very abstract to me. And then I learned that cattle are not cheap. And if you have a lot of them, it means you're doing all right. So it'd be like asking somebody how much they have. So how's your, what's in your 401k? You know, <laughs> what's the market balance today? So I learned not to ask that. But sort of same principle here. When you tell somebody that you have 1,000 uh, uh, goats and 3,000 sheep, that means you're doing very well. Because not only do you have that livestock, you have to be able to feed the livestock. You have to have land on which they can graze. You have to have the people that can take care of them. And you have to be able to kind of take care of the people that take care of them. So it's a, it's a big operation. So yeah, Nabal is this rancher uh, um, with all this livestock. So yeah, and then what happens? We learn about this guy and his wife kind of in that area where David is, is camping out. What, what's the next thing that happens? David heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep. Yes, it's sheep shearing time. So this is going to be a joyous time, kind of a sort of a harvest festival time almost. A lot of work. They don't have electric shears. They're using, it tells us a little bit also about kind of the, the technology of the time. Clearly they can take wool and turn it into fabric and they can also uh, have metal implements to shear the sheep. What were you gonna say, Gail? I'm not gonna, I was just making the sheep. You were making the sheep shearing <laughs> with your little fingernail scissors. Yes, they're shearing the sheep. Uh, so that's happening. So. Uh, and the thing to know about these things, like um, in almost any agricultural culture, when you have a harvest time, there's a lot of work, but there's also a lot of celebration. You joyfully celebrate the produce of the land or the livestock. So this is going to be huge piles of wool everywhere, but also huge parties. And so David, maybe we think, has the idea that oh he's got you know he's got to feed all of his workers he's gonna have a big party now would be a good time for me to see can can we have some of the seven layer dip can we come to this can we crash your party a little bit uh, and what do we learn about what David has been up to in the wilderness of Paran as he's been um, in in Nabal's neighborhood sounds like he's been kind of protector of the shepherds. Yes, he's been the protector of the shepherds. And that's good to know because, um, you know, it's a, it's a large area. Barbed wire has not been invented. There, there aren't natural barriers. You kind of know where maybe roughly one person's territory ends and another person's begins, but it's a little, it's a little vague. Um, certainly there's a lot of things that could hurt you out there. The Philistines are always in the area, always a potential threat. And so, as uh, we learn later, David has been protecting Nabal's sheep out of the goodness of his heart. There's been no, it, we do get the sense that there, because if you kind of read between the lines here, that back then, like there sometimes is now, people would sometimes run a protection racket. This is what the mafia does. It's a nice bakery you got here. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it. I'll make sure nothing, uh, you know, sales every month. 
the um, uh, lots of places in the world still work this way. Kind of a, uh, I'll protect, I'll do you the favor of protecting your block, your property, your your business, or whatever. You just got to give me a little bit of a fee, and if you don't give me the fee, I will destroy your property, your business, whatever the case may be. So David says, we took care of your property and we did not charge you. We just did it because we're good people and we're just out here in the wilderness. Nothing better to do. So he sends how many men? Ten young men. Uh, and he says, go to Carmel, Carmel, greet Nabal in my name. And how would you characterize the greeting in verses six through eight? Sucking up. Yeah, it's very nice. It's like formal, it's polite, it's uh, not demanding, it's, uh, and also, um, remind me a little bit of David's resume. Who is David? If you looked up his, he was a shepherd, he was a shepherd. and then what did he do after that? He worked for Saul. He worked for Saul. Like in the mailroom? No highest level of the cabinet, sort of secretary of defense kind of situation. Um, Son-in-law, married Saul's daughter. What had he done to get to this level in Saul's cabinet? What's that? He did play the lyre, so he is a musically gifted guy, uh, this poet. Yeah, and we know that people sung his song, so he's this um, you know, recording artist. And what else did he do to get in, in into sort of the high ranks of David or of Saul's administration? Uh, what? Uh, love the military leader. Military leader. Yeah, he's a soldier. He's Stormin Norman Schwarzkopf. <laughs> he's General Patton, and he would have been known throughout Israel. He's not some secret person that nobody's heard about. We know that he's known because. Nabal says, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Meaning, he's not really, it's a rhetorical question. He knows enough to know that David is the son of Jesse. So he, he knows his whole story. As who, who would not have heard of Goliath's death? Who would not have heard of David's military victories? So uh, it's, um, he's a known quantity. So he sends these 10 men to greet him in his name, and it's pretty significant to say peace to you, peace to your house, peace to everything you have. Notice he's peace to three things. You, your house, and all that you have. Saying, I'm a military leader on the run with an armed band, and many people would have maybe taken advantage of you and attacked you and stolen your stuff, but I'm not going to hurt you, I'm not going to hurt your house, I'm not going to steal any of your stuff. That's what he's saying. I come in peace to you, everyone you love, and all that you have. I'm not here to steal anything from you. Um, and he says, by the way, we have been taking care of your shepherds. They've been out there in the wilderness, uh, and you've been waiting to shear your sheep, and I notice you have a great harvest of wool and, you know, we helped you out a little bit. And all we would, all we would like, can we find favor in your eyes? Um, can you give us some of the seven layer dip? We would, we, we would like some Gatorade. We've been out here in the wilderness. Can you share something with us? You're a, clearly a rich man. I mean, look at, look at how much wool you've gotten from your 3,000 sheep. And then what happens? Nabal rebuffs him and says, H E double toothpicks, no. And uh, who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Uh, this is kind of a, a term of contempt. And um, he says, There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. So shall I give my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed for my shears and give it to men who come from I don't know where? So he's saying, you, are, you might be servants that have left your master David. You're just conning me. Yeah, so David's a great guy, maybe. Maybe he's been watching my flocks. But maybe you're, maybe you're rogue servants. This is uh, what I call a false justifying narrative. A story you tell in your head 
to allow you to come to certain conclusions that benefit you. Uh, one false, I was just thinking, trying to think of an example of a false justifying na- narrative. We have to be tough on crime. Crime is exploding. There's an epidemic of crime. Would you like to see, from 1996 to today, a violent crime in the United States? Down. These are uh, violent victimizations per 1,000 Americans ages 12 and older. It was near 80 in 1993, and it has gone down, and this goes through 2021. We're still waiting on the 2022 data, but I am pretty sure it's not like a huge upward spike. But this comes from the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, which takes all the reporting from police uh, around the country. So that's, that's the true narrative of crime in the United States. But if you think that there's a lot of crime in the United States, you have a false justifying narrative to maybe enact policies or, you know. And so we do this all the time. Uh, Your spouse says she will be home at six o'clock. She gets home at seven. This person doesn't care about me. This person never tells the truth. And now I'm gonna get angry and um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out with my, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a shopping spree to show that person, or whatever the case may be. Or, you know, the, the things that you have, all, maybe, maybe she got a flat tire on the way home. Maybe, you know, there's lots of other explanations for almost every situation. But often we get a false justifying narrative in our head that will justify certain things we'd like to happen. Um, if you start saying, that person always such and such. Or that person never such and such. There's probably more going on. Um, and often, you know, what you want to do in those situations is ask yourself, is there something that I gain from this narrative? Even if it's my own righteous indignation, do I like holding and harboring this grudge? So uh, you see, um, again, just one of the many aspects of human, the human condition come out in Nabal just out of thin air. There are many servants these days who are deserting their masters. That's probably what you're doing, even though he has no reason to believe that. But that's what he comes up with out of thin air so that he doesn't have, because he, what he wants is to keep all his stuff for himself. It's just to justify his greed. And so the, what's amazing about human beings is that we can almost always, immediately, our brains give us reasons for us to do what we want to do, and they give us reasons to not do what we don't want to do. The best description, uh, or best example of this, one of the best examples of this, uh, comes from an episode of This American Life, which is a radio show on NPR. It's been around for 20, 30 years. And each week it picks a theme and does stories on the theme. It's sort of storytelling, sometimes investigative journalism, really fascinating stuff. If you listen on 103.3 in Waco, you can hear it on the radio or you can get it on a podcast. And one of the themes, one of the um, episodes, the theme was the the, um, sort of things we tell ourselves. And he begins with the story of his wife. Um, and he are home on a Saturday, the doorbell rings and it's the UPS guy dropping something off and she asks him to get the door because she's still in her pajamas and feels uncomfortable answering the door in her pajamas. And he immediately starts, he, what he says is he's reflecting on this now after the fact, what was amazing to me is how quickly my brain immediately produced reasons why I shouldn't get up from the couch and why she should be the one that gets the door. And her pajama's not that revealing. She's fine, it's just the UPS guy. Again, he didn't try to think through these justifying reasons to not do the thing. His brain immediately gave them to him. There, your brain will immediately tell you why it, you, sh- you don't need to fold the laundry. Your brain will immediately tell you why you don't need to tell your spouse about the extra $100 you spend on the thing. Your brain will just offer up these justifications for what you want to do or don't want to do. I, I don't, you know, the, the, um, there's all kinds of things that you think you should do, but you don't do. I will not work out today because I didn't sleep well last night. I will do it tomorrow. All these things, the, the, the justification. So Nabal has this example here uh, that he comes up with. So, and we're about to see another one as well with not just Nabal, but David. So this rudeness, this contempt, and then um, what, what's the next thing that happens? What's David's response? 
What's his Christian, godly response to Naval's uh, provocative words? Grab your swords. Grab your swords. Let's go. Let's ride. ride. That's right. That's right. Grab your grenade. Strap on your holster. Let's get on our Harleys and ride. Yeah, let's go do this thing. Uh, It's sort of an OK Corral, Wyatt Earp sort of situation in Tombstone. Uh, Let's go do this. Uh, He does leave 200 remaining with the baggage, it says, which indicates how much baggage there was and how valuable it was if you would leave 200 armed men to protect it. And it's not, don't think, you know, monogrammed Louis Vuitton luggage. It's, it's, by baggage, it means there's supplies. They probably had some animals of their own because people were supplying them, the people of Israel. Um, so it's, it's food, it's supplies, it's all those sorts of things. So it's like an army camp, small army camp for 600 men. So you guys stay here, watch this, and we're going to take 400 men to go after uh, Nabal and his people. Um, if you've ever felt that sort of rush of adrenaline, uh, uh, that, um, you know, when your child comes home from school and you hear about what someone said or did to them, they did what? I'm going to go choke that kid. Like, you know, you want to go, you know, it's kind of that, that stress response, you know, the fight or flight. Here, and this is the fight response. I'm going to go take care of this. So that rage and that righteous indignation. So this is happening. You can imagine them on their way. Uh, uh, running to wherever Nabal is, or maybe if they have some donkeys, or maybe they're, somebody's riding donkey, but they're on their way to attack. And then one of the young men told Abigail, and by the way, young men here is always that word na'ar, which means sort of like young lieutenant, young servant, young cadet kind of situation. Um, and it's that, I always tell people, it's the prop, somebody quoted it to me the other day, Proverbs, whatever it is, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That word is not child, it is na'ar. It's not about raise your children in the church, and they won't get arrested when they're 18. They will not get a DUI when they're 25. That's not what that verse means. Train up a na'ar, and the way they should go is train up your lieutenants in the military, so when they're older, they'll be good soldiers and generals in the kingdom. So uh, here the na'ar of, um, of Nabal sees what's about to happen. He sees that David has been protecting Nabal's property. He sees that David asked for some help for his men, some food, and that Nabal has more than enough to do so, but that Nabal has refused, not only refused, but refused rudely, has humiliated David. And he also sees that David has now had this response, this enraged response, I'm going to go settle this score, and uh, tells Abigail the whole thing. What does it tell you about the family that this young man, this Nahar, goes to Abigail? Well, that she can fix it. That she can fix it. Yeah. They respect her. They respect they don't her. Respect them all. They don't respect uh yeah, you, you go to the parent that can get things done. You know, almost every household, there's like the kids know. If you want something done, who do you ask? Um, and so go, he, he goes to Abigail. And with this great description of what David would do, and his men did for him, they, they, we, didn't have, we, we were protected. They were like a wall around us to keep protecting us. Um, and he says to her, Figure out what you want to do about this. For harm is determined against our master and all his house, as he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. And we all know somebody like that. Someone who won't listen to reason. Somebody who you could, you could present, look, if you don't change this aspect of your life, something bad's going to happen. And you're like, oh, no, not going not gonna to listen. So that's the kind of person Nabal is. Uh, and so she springs into action. What does she do? She gets all the supplies. She gets all the supplies. Uh, it's a lot. So 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine. And a skin of wine is not just a little, you know, we think about, I don't know, you've seen in Italian restaurants, they often hang those little wine skins on the side of the wall with the bottles of olive oil and the 
Chianti bottle holding the candle. It's the standard decor for Italian restaurants. So we think of a little skin of wine, but these are whole, like the whole skin, not just a little, so a lot of skin. So wine, five, now why wine? Why would you send, don't you want that to be sober minded? Well, you can't really keep water. Water won't keep. So this is gonna, the alcohol content keeps it. Um, uh, sanitary. So wine, five sheep already prepared. It's a lot of meat. Five sales of parched grain, so uh, um, a huge amount. 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and puts them on donkeys. Uh, the 18 wheeler of the ancient Near East. And sends them to him. By the way, we have found in Egyptian records around the same time of lists of supplies that they would give to their troops in the field, and it matches the same, just, you know, this is what you fed troops. Lots of good carbs, lots of um, uh, protein, and, uh, and the ability to hydrate. So, sends these on the donkeys and says, go before me, I come after you. And importantly, end of verse 19, what does she not do? Doesn't tell Nabal. She also knows what kind of guy he is. She rides on the donkey and comes to David, and what does what is David saying, or sort of what had he just said as she approaches? This is verse 21. He's just telling, he's, you know, stewing, and he's just saying, like, a lot of good to me to take care of these guys. I'm going to kill them all. Yep. I'm, he's still enraged. He says, I'm, I, like, um, I'm going to kill every single last one of them. Now, not the women and children. But every man I will kill. I'm gonna. Th what? Where else have we seen this response recently in the book of First Samuel? Saul. Saul. And what? Who did Saul kill? All the, priests. All the priests and the whole village. So he kind of took it to another level. But it's this is showing. You know, maybe David's a little bit better, and that he just wants to kill all the men. But basically, it's saying this is the same kind of. Uh, testosterone-fueled, righteous indignation, I'm going to settle the score, you did me wrong, and I'm going to get back at you. Uh, so this is, again, one of those stories where, you know, whenever people talk about the Bible being some made-up text, you know, people just cooked it up in the back room to create this religious system that would be the opiate of the masses. And I always think, well, if you were doing that, you probably wouldn't make all the good guys also look like bad guys. You, you wouldn't write to make your own self look bad. You ever read people's <coughs> bios on a website? If you go to St. Albans' website, you'll see staff and clergy, and you can read all the bios. I do not mention my scores in the presidential fitness test in middle school, which were abysmal. I do not talk about the fact that as a straight A student in high school, I got one B and it was in driver's ed. I do not talk about the people that said no to me when I said, would you go to prom? I do not talk about any of those things. I only tell you all the good things I've accomplished because this is what we do. The Bible, however, even though it's written by the people of Israel, it's written by folks who want to tell the story of God's greatness and faithfulness to them. They don't sugarcoat. They don't whitewash. They don't sweep under the rug. <coughs> David is king. And this text is being written in part to um, show the people of Israel in the, who, this was written down after these events. So later on, at the end of David's life, even after that, to try to talk about where did David come from and why is it good that we have a Davidic kingship and all those things. So you want to make your, your George Washington look good. David's the George Washington. And so, you know, what do we do with our national leaders? George Washington never tell a lie. He, yes, he chopped down that cherry tree, but he told the truth. And when he's shown cross in the Delaware, it's, it's like, hmm, like I'm, you know, it's not George Washington picking his nose, right? We show the good things. But here in the Bible, they show the pick in the nose and worse. This is David getting way off the good track. Um, and it shows how human he is. So... Uh, Aaron. Yes. But, you know, when he says about like, one male up, but the, those men had not done anything. They were not involved. Exactly. Yes, the men of Nabal had done nothing. 
He wasn't just going to go kill Nabal. He was going to kill all the men. Yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's a great point. So here is his rage that is it's, it's beyond even what would be fair. It's King Saul-level rage and irrationality. Uh, just to want to burn it down. And what's interesting to me is he says, I did him a good thing. He has repaid evil for good. And so now I'm going to answer his evil with more evil. And you see how this is, this is how family feuds start. This is how wars get started. This is how brothers and sisters get estranged. This is how relationships break down. Um, and that's what's happening here. You did something. I was good to you, but you did this to me. Well, now I'm going to. And this is why everybody hates Jesus. Because he said, you don't just forgive someone seven times, but 70 times seven. And nobody likes that. Revenge tastes much sweeter. And so uh, this, this shows the humanity of David. And, uh, and we're going to kind of leave it, leave it here. You're going to see what happens. Um, I've already kind of given it away because Abigail will say sort of what Meatloaf said. I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. She'll, she'll get David to pump the brakes. But you'll see, you'll see how that unfolds next week. But um, I do want to kind of give you my, my, my highlights from this passage. But before I do that, questions or observations from you all. Things that we feel like we haven't addressed or haven't uncovered. Well, um, I think it's that last verse is interesting um, where he says to God, if I don't do this, then you can do it to me. He I mean, makes it, he swears yeah. by God. Yeah. Usually when you have the sense of righteous indignation, you feel that God is on your side. And he absolutely feels that God is on his side. What's interesting is that he, he's never been less worthy of grace, help, God's favor. And yet at this moment, this is where God shows him favor by sending Abigail to help him out. So it's a, there's, some, there's some real, uh, that whole thing of God showing favor to those who don't deserve it. God, at least, is on, on brand in this story. What, what else? Is, yeah, yeah. I think David really overreacts when he says he has returned me evil for good. Well, it wasn't so much evil. It was a, an insult. And yeah. He just didn't get what he wanted, but he, you know. He wasn't slaughtered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Nabal's actions were to not give him food uh -huh. and to call him names. Yeah. And now David's going to kill Nabal and every man in his camp. I think that's truly an overreaction. It is a slight overreaction. <laughs> just slightly. There's a, some kind of, there's a little bit of toddler energy here. You know, when you want your toddler to finish the peas. Uh, and not only will I not finish the peas, I will spread them all over your living room and I will grind them into the upholstery. Uh, and apparently David and his men had some provisions. Yes, they do they have some. Yeah. People there yeah. To yeah. They just wanted the party for you, don't they? Yeah, they, they, they do clearly have some provisions, but they, I mean, it looks like he's having a great party and maybe. So, and his request, it's, it's not, uh, David's request is not strange or extravagant and there's a lot of food and there's a big party so yeah they want you know well we've done some things we're out here in the desert it also to me gives some indication of maybe the stress that david is under if you have ever lost your temper and said things you didn't mean to say to someone you love it pro you probably you probably were not just back from the silent retreat you probably were maybe going through a difficult there were lots of things in your life, and this person just kind of happened to walk into your crosshairs at the wrong moment, um, and you unload. So David, he's supposed to be king, but he's not. Saul's still technically king. Uh, Saul still wants to kill him. He's living in the desert. It's, it's not a great situation. So it, it does reveal a little bit about where he is. Yeah, other things you feel like we haven't covered? Yes, Phyllis. Yeah. Was she there with the festival? Was she back at the ranch? Was she in between? How did he know where to go find Abigail? Good question. So, yeah. He just had all this food, just happened to have it. Yep. Uh, 
great question. Where did this Na'ar, this young man, go find Abigail to present this situation, and where did she get all the provisions? Uh, it doesn't say. It, it um, is likely that she is kind of back home, uh, sort of back at the ranch, back at the main compound um, with all these supplies. It's, it's hard to imagine uh, if she, if uh, her being at the shearing or something and having that much extra and be able to kind of slip out. So, but I mean, but the text doesn't say, so it leaves it in some, some doubt. She's near enough that he can find her and she's got all these supplies. All right, so um, my, the, the big ideas here, uh, at least some that I would offer to you, the first is low anthropology, which is a theme that comes up a lot in the scriptures and in my teaching on the scriptures because it's in it a lot. Low anthropology is a reference, if you're a St. Albans person, you've heard me talk about this, but it's, the, it's your understanding of the nature of human beings. Do you think that human beings are basically good? Uh, and all you have to do to get people to be good is give them information and tell them to be good. If you have that understanding, and you're a physician, and you're treating a diabetic, all you need to do is give them information about healthy diet and exercise, and they will do it. You have a high anthropology. You have a high view of people's ability to, that all they lack is information, and if you give them good information, they will make good choices. And you did this with your kids, right? I mean, that worked. You told them that the boyfriend was good for nothing, and they said, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. I will end that relationship, and I will, I will marry somebody who is a, a corporate uh, lawyer uh, with good health insurance. So uh, if you have a low anthropology, that means you have an honest appraisal of what human beings are like, meaning that though there are good parts of us, really beautiful parts of us, there are also ways where we do irrational things, we uh, sabotage our relationships, we um, uh, get wrapped around the axle with grudges that will hold on till the day we die. We, do all kinds of things that hurt ourselves and hurt others. Um, and uh, the Bible is nothing if not a case study after case study of low anthropology. And so here's David, a man after God's own heart, who's demonstrated real incredible faith and depth and, and compassion and, and faithfulness, but who's a human being. And so we see this low anthropology in Nabal. We also see it in David, which is why I have point two, total depravity, which is an, it's, it's a phrase that came out of the Reformation and the Protestant Reformation. And many people uh, who, there's been a, a move in some areas of the Christian world to kind of get away from this understanding. Um, you, in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, there's a real push in the Episcopal Church and in other denominations to get away from language of sin because it makes me feel bad about myself. And so instead of saying I'm a sinner, we'll say, you know, I have, I, I've, um, you know, I don't know, some softer language around that. And when you say total depravity, which was this idea that came out of the reformers, um, they say, oh, that's, that's harsh. Are you saying I'm totally depraved? No, that's actually not what the phrase means. The phrase means that universal, the, the human condition is universally distributed. The, the part of creation that is broken, which applies to human beings as well, that, that there's no part of creation that's not affected by that in some way. There's not some corner over here where everybody's perfect. You, you see example after example of Christian communities that would say, we'll create this intentional Christian community over here, we'll, we'll grow our own food, and we'll, we'll wear natural fibers, and we'll read the Bible a lot, and uh, we'll separate ourselves from all the evil influences of Hollywood and we'll never go to Vegas ever. And um, uh, we'll, we'll, you see this again and again. And you, again and again, you see total depravity. You see the reality of the human condition show itself in that environment as well. Um, look at any intentional Christian community in history, whether it's a monastic order or um, some of the more contemporary examples, People that try to separate from society to create a perfect, harmonious thing, it always falls apart. Because wherever you go, you are there. And uh, um, 
That's not to say you shouldn't do those things. It's not to say there aren't good things in those things. I'm not. Those, I'm glad those monks are there making their beer and making their chocolate and whatever they're making. Great, keep it up. I'm glad those cloistered nuns are praying for me. Great, keep it up. But they, and you talk to anybody who's in the, in the religious life as a monk or nun or something like that. And they'll, they'll tell you, first of all, like they see this all the time. Don't, it's, it's not a, you don't, get, you don't get to step out of the world. You're always in it. So, uh, total depravity. Also, I think it's wonderful there's this quick thinking, empowered woman. That she's elevated in the text. Uh, this does not follow the standard narrative uh, in ancient Near Eastern understandings, where, um, uh, which was a very patriarchal culture, and this under, this idea that you know the the pater familias, the the man of the household, is the is the is the wise one who should direct everything and. You know, a woman should never speak up, and a woman, like, I, I went to seminary with a guy. We were in a class talking about, in Christian marriage, the idea is not one over the other, but mutual submission. This is what Ephesians 5 is about. Uh, as Christ loved the church, husbands love your wives, meaning you, you don't set yourself above, but you kind of put yourself in the position of a servant, which is what Christ did all the time. And uh, so we're talking about this idea of mutual submission, and this guy in class said, no, it's not, my marriage is not 50-50. It's 49-49, and over the mantle I keep my 2%, like my, my super voting class A shares, and I can overrule whatever. And it was a little creepy that he sort of referred to a place where one often keeps a rifle, kind of over the fireplace. It was a, it was a very weird moment. But there are people that think sort of, that, um, you know, uh, it is inappropriate for a woman to enact decision-making in the household unilaterally. And this is what Abigail does here. And she's praised for it. And it seems to be the way God works. And you know, I'm not saying that everybody in every marriage should act unilaterally in every situation. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. It, but what I'm saying is there is this um, understand, there's something, a simplistic understanding uh, both in the ancient Near East, the culture that produces text, and our own of sort of who should be the boss in a relationship. And often it falls on gender lines, and the man should be at the front, and the woman should be here. And, and I'm just saying, here's an example where you don't see that. And isn't that interesting? In a text that's 3,000 years before Christ, you see this kind of um, willing inclusion of somebody who is someone you wouldn't... I mean, she didn't have legal rights. She didn't own any of that property. Nabal could have taken her to the judge and said, she stole my stuff. Um, and yet she, she, she does this. Which continues, and one more thing, and then Sandy, don't forget your point. Um, this echoes some of the stuff in David's uh, origin story. The, as I talked about last week, the Ruth and Naomi story. Where you have um, the women are clearly the, the active protagonists in the story, and the men are sort of an, an afterthought. So when, uh, when you get to the New Testament and you see Jesus doing things like talking to women, which was not allowed, when you see him doing things like touching women with compassion, not exploitation, which was not allowed, uh, when you see him uh, having women be the first proclaimers of the resurrection, their testimony would not have been accepted in court, and the disciples dismiss it, the male disciples. But when I say Jesus is a proto-feminist, meaning feminism is just the idea that women are fully human. And Jesus demonstrates that time and time again. But he, he didn't create it a whole cloth. It exists. These are the seeds that get planted in the Hebrew scriptures that then come to um, blossom in Jesus' ministry. Sandy. Oh, well, I mean, I see several motivations for her doing that. <coughs> uh, she could have been protecting Nabal, her mm -hmm. husband, or the man, or feeling like it was just the right thing to do. Do we find out later? That is a great question. So Sandy said there could have been many motivations for why Abigail does what she does. And we'll leave it at that. <laughs> you can read ahead, but if you don't, with that, it'll become clear in the, in the next part of the chapter why she does what she does. And um, we know that at the beginning, we're told that she's wise and beautiful. By the way, this is why my Abigail daughter is named Abigail. And Abigail does mean delight of the father, the father's joy or something like that. So couldn't not mention that as a father who is <laughs> devoted to my own daughter, but um, and who is a quick-thinking and empowered woman, for sure. So any final comments before we end? All right, well, let me say a prayer. Dear God,
thank you for this text and what it shows us about who we are and about your grace to us, um, even when we, and especially when we don't deserve it. We pray that you'd help us where we need it. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Such a great. Yeah. Love and grace. Perfect. Hey, Tommy.